Okay, well, I'll start recording then. You should have gotten a pop up here a second ago. Welcome to the risk working group meeting uh, for July 6th, 2023. Um, I'm just uh, putting captions on now because you can do that, cap, do that too. And um, so uh, good to see you, Kate. Gary, good to see you again. Um, hey there, hey there. Sophie, of course. Um, so I just, uh, there's a few things we were talking about last time. I don't know where this is in the, um, where your item is in the agenda, Sophia, or if there's anything else that folks want to talk about. I wanted to bring up the OpenSSF risk dashboard effort because um, that was brought to our attention by David Wheeler in the last meeting. And um, mm -hmm. I know some of us are like I've, I've signed up to participate in that discussion, and I think Sophia is already participating in that discussion. Yeah, um, I have good. I have some thoughts, just to let you know what you're walking into. Yeah, we're recording. No, that's that's okay. Okay. I'll, I'll <laughs> PC. Um, two Fridays from now is it not this Friday? The following Friday that I can't attend. They've set up a four-hour meeting to basically use it as a working session to to dig into all the details because. So the, the background is they had a mock-up. David put together a mock-up and was like, is this what you want? How do we iterate on this? How do we design this for the right people? Um, and then I missed a couple of meetings and I came back and they had brought in someone to actually do a user journey study and interview a bunch of people and say, how would you use this? What are you looking for? Trying to identify personas and use cases um, and how that would align. So much more like UX and design driven approach to building something like this. Yeah. Um, so the last few meetings have been presenting the findings from those discussions and starting to sketch out what a design or approach would be. Um, but then at the end of the last meeting, there's sort of commentary around this isn't moving fast enough um, and they're expecting to see something coming out of it. Um, and so the proposal was to set up a four hour meeting instead of one hour, uh, which is usually the cadence to basically work through a mock up based on the feedback and the things that we have. Um, I think that the, the goals are still a little bit murky because they're trying to get something done quickly. And I think they did that approach and then they did the design approach and something in the middle is going to happen. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that's what you're walking into and that's why it's so long. They're usually only an hour long. Um, but Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in Wisconsin then. I'll try to be there. Um, I, I'm glad you'll be there because I'll be at Fosse, so I won't be able to participate. And I think we need someone with a metrics brain in there because we it was myself and Christine Abernathy that have more of the at least some exposure to chaos and metrics and stuff like that. But and then David, but then it's other folks from um, the open SSF. So I think someone who's thinking more about application of metrics and practice uh, would be uh, functionally relevant to that conversation uh, just because there are some things that hadn't been considered, like looking at the metric trending over time and how that would be implemented in a dashboard. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, I think they're going to make something. Yeah. Uh, it seems to still be very security oriented with acknowledgement that they need to look at some other factors that are more community and population related. Um, you might get a little bit squeamish when you look at how they've actually started defining metrics. So that's, I'm, I'm looking forward to other chaos books participating. Okay. So there's a resistance to use the, de the definition of the metrics we've already worked on? Well, they haven't even selected metrics yet. So in the okay. mock-up, he's uh, Michael, who's been leading the, the design, uh -huh. the, sort of the research discussions has suggested a few ideas or metrics concepts, not even specific metrics. So they haven't even gotten to the specific metric or definition yet. So I think that that's where we can be most helpful. I think just to say these are things that we already have, they've already been defined, and they're trying to build a tool. They already pre-implemented so we know it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think it sounds like they're almost there. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, I can't attend. So So that's an every other week meeting and the next one is two hour, four hours. Yep. Wow. I will, I'll, try, I'll be able to be there for a part of it, but I don't know if I can do four hours because it's the day before my mom's 80th birthday celebration that I'm co-organizing with my siblings and I'll be in Wisconsin. So I, well, I don't know if I can drop four hours in the middle of the day and survive my family. 
but I'll do what I can. That's all we can do. <laughs> all we can do. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thanks for thanks for that update, uh, Sophia. Um, so when we when we met last, we had a bunch of things that we talked about, but we're kind of trying to work toward a the metrics to use in a risk introductory metrics model. Is that accurate, Sophia? You know, like your first mover metric model for for risk, and I think everyone, if you don't know, metrics models are basically um, the grouping of metrics that are often used together by some practitioner um, in a way that makes sense. So most of the things that are metrics models have arisen from how people look at collections of metrics together. And we, we try to keep it around five, give or take metrics at the most um, in a particular, in any given metrics model, just because we've tried it with more and it tends to get unwieldy. And so this is, these are the thoughts that we had last time around, well, what, what would be the introductory risk metrics models? And so the first one we discussed was how transparent a project is. And there are some sort of comments around there, and this would be a metric that doesn't exist yet, as far as I know. I mean, I can't uh, claim to have committed all 80-ish metrics to the memory of my head, but I'm pretty sure we have not yeah. created one about uh, project transparency at this point. Transparency, is, transparency has multiple dimensions. Which dimension right. of transparency are we so, talking about here? So I think I think it's when companies decide to open source their project and make it closed source. So I guess this that particular little metric in there is uh, we discussed that as transparency and and how it poses risk and. We're not sure how to measure that. I do think we have a release frequency metric. Um, and I do think we have documentation oriented metrics. So, yeah, I think to kind of explain this one, um, I agree with you, Kate, that there's sort of a few contexts on how we could think about transparency. And so we were trying to essentially suggest a few, depending on the nature of the project. <laughs> like maybe one would be just again, like documentation is your governance model public and sort of like, how do you make decisions in a project and is all of that public? Um, and so that would be something like transparency, but the other conversation we had around it was around this sort of company control or ownership and sort of the risk well, that I, things are happening behind closed doors. So I, I would I would basically say that the risk that's there is the contribution policy and are you signing effectively an API such that the uh, things are aggregated inside that a so a company could basically take control of it, or are you basically letting people retain their copyrights? Because the copyright stuff de-risks my mind. Basically, retaining their own copyrights and being distributed copyright de-risks the licensing changing out from underneath you. Because things going pub private again inside an organization is a, a function of, um, you know, do they have the power with the with their copyrights and the licensing to do so? And if contributions have been made under an API, some of that is more accessible. So, so I it's a thought, factor. Yeah, I thought that until last week. <laughs> uh. <Okay. laughs> oh, this uh, risk is a moving is a fast moving uh, ecosystem well, here. Well, because I was thinking about this from sort of the prominent use case of a license change and the move that we assume right. a couple of organizations going to SSPL, which isn't a recognized open source license. But in the most recent case, I'm thinking about RHEL. We're in a recorded call, but it's a public event. Um, what they did to essentially restrict their source mm -hmm. code to paying customers only versus releasing it. But so far as it's been described, they're not infringement of DPL because they'll still submit their patches upstream. Um, or I guess substantial changes upstream yeah. or whatever the, I, I need to know the specifics of these licenses better, but from what I've read, it seems like it isn't infringing upon the license, but there definitely seems to be things that are breaking as a result of it. Um, and so that in spirit is the same sort of thing of taking something clo like closing the source in a way, um, versus having that totally public source. But I think that's, it is a slightly nuanced thing because it's not changing the license is just making the source code unavailable. Well, it, it's not the source code per se. The source code is still available with all the upstream projects. What's missing is the aggregation that they've done. 
Yes. And that's exactly. where they've added value. Okay. And so they're basically, you know, I have not had a chance to study it. I have been traveling and I catch, I catch it across the feed and go, oh, that's going to make things interesting for a bit. So, um, um, so is, but, is what they've done, if they're using a GPL project and they've added something to it, I guess no. I'm, I'm a little bit confused because I thought that if I was using GPL and I modified it, I had to contribute that back upstream. So everything I keep my changes upstream. private. And they they, money for they it. are going to contribute back upstream. It just basically the comment was, we're still going to do this. It's just, it's going to have to be audited because it's not publicly available. So in theory, right. they haven't infringed upon the license yet. <laughs> but I like I'm just thinking about in terms of how how we're setting up this metric. I don't, I don't even know. Maybe this is a test case. What would have been the best indicators that something like that could have happened? Um, and I think I keep coming back to elephant factor in terms of company control um, in terms of how many. Yeah, people I, 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 I'm I'm I'm, this... I'm 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 lining up with you there. Uh, it's a function of who has control, and I, I'd say this more the more people that um, have the control is distributed to. The, the lower the risk. Mm -hmm. Agree. And so like the other ones that we mentioned, we talked about could be suggestions for a deeper dive on this if you're very concerned or want to do something more robust. But I think if we need something that's a lightweight, single thing to point to that, that would be what I'm gravitating toward. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm still having a hard time understanding how they can charge money for a GPL software service or product if the code they're so, using so isn't open source the code is up open source and they've and they're keeping it open source what they're doing though is they basically add patches they uh curate they um lock on certain versions and everything else so all the upstreams are still open source but their instance that they're shipping may have certain patches applied to them to fix bugs usually and that the question is what's happening there but if I'm patching bugs on a GPL project, am I not required by the license to open source those patches? No. What's well, not, not basic? A... Sorry, keep going. Yeah. It, it, you can, you know, best practice is as soon as you apply it in your own thing, you want to put it upstream so you don't have to keep maintaining those patches. Right. Um, they, they are saying they're going to do it, but it's happening at a different pace. Okay. It would happen right. like it's very easy to then put it in their thing, but then there's a whole process to get it upstream. And sometimes those upstream patches, you know, take six months to get the upstream maintainers to accept them and put them in a formal release. So it's mm -hmm. a question of time scales and, you know, what they're making available when. And like I say, I really haven't studied in detail, but they are they add value and that's why people are, you know, using them and they're making all this stuff available to their customers. And everything will eventually be upstream. It's just a question of what time frame. Does yeah. that match your understanding, Sophia? Yes. Hmm. I mean, that's sort of that. That is the distribution model for the most part. It's just because of GPL, they have to bring it back to the community. Hmm. What do, can we say what software this is? Rel. Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Yes. <laughs> okay. And, you know, and they've been doing a lot of work cleaning up the licensing in RHEL 2 recently as well. So there's all that other side of it. And that stuff hasn't necessarily gone on stream yet, too. I see. Well, I mean, I guess, mm -hmm. hasn't Red Hat always kind of done that with RHEL? They have. They just used to have that all hosted in a public repository. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm actually curious now if this is going to happen with other distros like OpenShift. Um, which in theory has a similar model, except for they're, they've been lumping a lot more stuff into it. So it's not just one project anymore. It's not just a distribution of Kubernetes. It includes little things from the, the rest of the CNCF portfolio to offer more of a platform-based tool. But they've always generally kept OpenShift in an available format um, because that has been their model of operation. And so I feel like it's the, the question now is if they've done this with RHEL, are they going to do those other parts of the portfolio as well? Time will oh, tell. I missed, I missed, yeah, I, I, this is sort of like um, mind blowing for me. Um, 
changes. It's very the... appropriate for this conversation. Yeah, no, it changes. It's it appropriate of... for him. I, I... <laughs> changes some assumptions I, I, I... I make, I guess. Well, like I say, it, it's but I consider it like one dimension of transparency. I think there's other tra aspects of transparency that get into the whole dependency information. And, you know, do you have everything you need to build it? Is it reproducible? Is it, you know, I think there's other dimensions. And I, I'd be curious to hear what Dave Wheeler's um, perspective is on what transparency is too. I think Dave in was in his mind. initial discussion. Wasn't he here yeah. the last time? He was here last time. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember what his opinion was and that that is not coming back up. Yeah. Um, so I guess some of what we just talked about gets to this whole point here about trying to assess this, this openness versus full openness mm -hmm. and the elephant factor. So, um, is there, is there like, I guess elephant factor is, um, it sounds like low, like elephant factor is a component of of this like it kind of becomes mm -hmm. in the foreground then right yeah a, a, another example that has happened in recent you know i guess about five or six years ago now or four or five anyhow is you know um amazon acquiring free rtos mm -hmm. and they come out with amazon free rtos and you know the active upstream project was not that active for about a year or two and then it's been restarted since then but you know these sorts of shifts are happening in various projects where there's corporate interests getting engaged. Where things become both open and closed at the same time, kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like like you say, one of the things I was doing when I did a survey of the ecosystem for our tosses is I had a column of who controls the commits. And I was, I basically would say, is it a community that controls the commits or is it a, a corporation that controls the commits? So you're saying looking at like the reviewer and approver list? Yeah, the reviewer and approver list. And like I say, does it need to go through an API? Like, I'm um, oh, sorry. Does it need to go through some sort of um, contributor agreement before it gets accepted into the code base? And it's, you know, the final decision, basically a corporation or is it a community member? that's making those decisions. And are the policies visible? And that goes to transparency too. Is it very mm -hmm. clear how you can get contributions accepted if you are not an uh, organization, you know, it's an organization that controls the main part of the code. I don't know how to express that governance model. Um... Well, I think it still fits under transparent governance. I think what, what we're talking about, and I'm, I guess coming back to the original question, is we're trying to describe this in general for cases that apply to both community-led and company-led projects. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case of a company-led project, then that's, again, like how you would get more visibility on company-specific controls that could lead to more community-led versus company-led yeah, like like, so another example is Yocto, which was very much a company-led project by Intel at one point. And we've transitioned it over time to be much more community-led now. And, you know, the corporations have shifting priorities, right? And shifting strategies. And so the question is how resistant, you know, how much can the, which is elephant factor, how much can the project survive without, you know, if a company's strategy shifts, can the project still survive? Mm -hmm. That's what you're sort of looking for from a risk perspective. Excuse me, I just have to go for a step off for a second. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think through how to make these, um, like, okay, this is a metric. Elephant factor is a metric. So, that's something that we can actually point to. Um, some of these other items under here, um, I don't know how to, I don't know if we have metrics to measure them and I don't know what those metrics might be. So elephant factor, 
Well, I feel I see the the sort of specifics and contribution and control as like a, a sub component of elephant factor because you're mm -hmm. looking at like the percentage of contribution by one company. Then, if you're defining contribution as commits or PRs or reviewers, you're basically doing that. Um, it's just more, again, like if you if you have a high, I guess you want a, a low elephant factor is a small number of firms or like say one, then that might be a case to review it from that lens. Or maybe, again, like it, it's up to your risk tolerance. Like I think that's, again, this is what we're trying to help people assess. Yeah, yeah I think that there's got to be some room for interpretation because I, I feel like it might be hitting bedrock to say that you can create a profile of a given company has such and such kind of reputation based on these metrics. It's, it's very much based on... Uh, governance policies they've made or how they've changed a license or something like that. Those events would give an indication that if an elephant factor is very high and a specific company is is one of the elephants, right? Like you might want to consider that differently if you're at one firm versus another even. Like there's there's a lot of angles to how do you view a company in your risk profile. And I'm not sure that that's worth trying to like specifically pinpoint because it could be something that's so highly specific to your application or your team. Does that make sense? It does. And I think it, you, you could go, you could always go further. So I, I feel like I like coming back to this sort of, do you have XYZ documentation public and what's the elephant factor as sort of like the main indicators. Yeah. And then after that, you should probably know what that company is if it's one, and then you, you take that in your own contextual direction. And that can be sort of like in, in the description of how this could be interpreted for you. I'd also say that certain corporations, different segments behave differently. Mm, yes, so I, I'd, be very, I'd be very resistant. I'd be very resistant about making an overall judgment about an organization based on one of their interactions with one project when they have multiple projects sitting out there. Um, so I just put yeah, that caveat fair. in there. I mean, yeah, the larger a firm is, the more variance you're going to get from engagement to engagement. Um, all too familiar. Like, you know, mm. I'm not sure. <laughs> Indeed. I, I'm going to have to drop at the bottom of the hour for another um, conflicting call I've got set up today. But is there anything else you guys want me to comment on before I drop? Um, can actually skip to the next one and we can yeah. come back to the start if we want because I want to get Kate's opinion on this because we we poked David and it sounds like there's another paper coming, uh, which we'll see when that happens. Um, but we were coming back to this idea of trying to how to how to look at a project or package in relation to the ecosystem as sort of part of an understanding of what it is. And we talked about the census report as one method for sort of scoring relevance or usage based on the criteria that were outlined by those researchers. Um, and then this is the rat hole I went down, found another paper that was looking at the NPM um, package manager and looking at network robustness and basically started testing the impact of removing a certain amount of nodes and the connectedness of the nodes on the impact of whether or not you were going to have failure in that one portion or across the entire project. So basically looking at the correlation of failure in specific nodes to functionality or I guess they had um not that so one. is it resilient? Resilient. So where do you want here? I think it is because okay. uh, they were using the terminology was a little odd and I was trying to put it in both like because there's like research terms and math terms but they're also talking about technical things and some of the language overlaps in a funky way um, and it's not the same thing so I apologize I'm struggling to talk about it um, but I thought it was an interesting okay. approach and the more that I was reading and I was like I don't think that people can just do this like on off the cuff and so maybe this shouldn't be what we recommend um, but I was basically just trying to find if there were existing mechanisms that people have looked at for sort of the role in in the ecosystem and this is one of the ones that came up at least from a dependency perspective um, and it also relied a lot on page rank um, and looking at the methodology behind the page rank as a way to rate connections within an, an ecosystem as a way to say like this is a major hub versus a minor hub and using the page rank as part of that ranking. Um, yeah. Was I kind of, yeah. The counter examples I've got in my head right now 
um, Linux kernel. You know, how would that play into this type of scenario? Other ones are like uh, the LLVM and GCC. They're like a new tool chain, right? Both of those yeah. are being used pervasively, but they don't show up in this stuff at all. No, it's no. true. They're like infrastructure. They're like uh, the mm -hmm. C compilers are core infrastructure for a lot of things. Yep. All right, bye, Gary. So <laughs> I, I mostly just like, I guess what I was circling around is I'm not really sure if we can recommend a metric for this. <laughs> And that I think there are definitely considerations that you should have, but to mm -hmm. be able to do this type of analysis for everything that you're considering just seems a bit cumbersome. Well, the thing is too, it's a lot of this stuff will shift very fast over time in some of the packaging ecosystems as well. Mm -hmm. Actually, that, that paper goes into it a bit. They looked at it for a 10 year period, which I thought was fun. And so they looked oh, at the evolution okay. of um, adding and removing dependencies. And actually, the number of dependencies is capping at a bit, like it was growing more and now it's slowing down. Um, but they tried to oh, look cool. at sort of the evolution of it as well. It's not a very long paper, but it took me a while to read because of, again, the aforementioned terminology yeah. that met the tech overlap. Oh, uh, cool. That, that's cool. I'll have a look at that. Yeah, thanks. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'd say the ecosystem, yeah. more packaging ecosystem, as opposed to overall open source ecosystem, I guess is what yeah. I think I'm hearing too. Well, I suppose okay. kind of wanted to, to get your, I guess, 30 second thought on what is what did that mean to you? <laughs> Sorry, I guess it didn't begin with that. <laughs> well, what, what, like I say, what it meant to me is it's very much a packaging ecosystem Thing. I thought your comment that things are starting to plateau, I found very fascinating. I think that's a, a growing awareness of uh, the fact that having lots of dependencies, um, trimming it down is important for reducing the attack surface on the security mm -hmm. side. Yeah, for sure. And so the question, so, so in some senses, the ecosystem criticality store is in some senses like, you know, how, how much is it really pulling in from a dependency and what's your attack surface potential mm -hmm. to me? Mm -hmm. And can we basically do something about, you know, if it's got a very large, you know, the smaller number of dependencies, I think in the smaller your attack surface is actually, I think, uh, a, a good thing. And I think there's, you know, I think there's a lot of gratuitous dependencies lurking out there. They're not really essential. Having people start to focus on first bringing in what they really need is probably a better health, thing, better health mm -hmm. strategy for this stuff. So that you said that things are plateauing makes me feel like slightly hopeful because all the other things I've been hearing up till now is it's like you know, 84 to 500 type of deal over a couple year period. Um, and so in this ecosystem, it could look totally different. This is only NPM. So there are well, I think, you know, in the depths, in the depths dev stuff, right? They've got a bunch of different ecosystems that they've surveyed. And I'm wondering if there's stuff we can learn out of that space. Well, I can take that yeah, as my next was... to do. In theory, I wanted to do that as part of my actual job too. So um, they oh, put excellent. Two purposes. Um, there are just public data sets on BigQuery and I don't have a BigQuery oh. budget because I work at Google. I guess I shouldn't say that out loud, but I don't, I don't think that's a huge. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, hey, one piece of work for two benefits is always a good thing as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been monkeying so, around a lot of GitHub logs. So it's the time, it's the season. <laughs> Okay. I need to drop now, but good to catch up with you guys briefly. Talk you to you in a couple weeks. Yeah, good to catch up with you. Um, so I guess for the ecosystem piece, what I guess, because we have our dependency metrics, but I feel like the more that we're talking about it in this context, we might have met something broader by ecosystem. And I think we come back to dependencies as like a, a volume or some sort of magnitude problem. Mm -hmm. where I think, I almost think that the more we were talking about the sort of interplay between the project and the company is also part of that ecosystem conversation. Yeah. Uh, like, I think it, it's like, if this is a project coming out of Red Hat, then to me, that has a different flavor or role in the market than a project like Python, that's a language and community led. Like, I, right. again, I guess it couldn't correlate languages to anything else, but I just think that there is nuance, like besides like 
asking people to define what it is in the ecosystem like that we, that's not really what metrics do versus measuring it so i guess i'm not really sure how to measure this beyond dependency but feel like we should have something that looks more broadly at what this is doing in the ecosystem like how do we describe the role of linux in a metric like we can't really do that to kate's point yeah but i like it as a concept so and that that's what's making it challenging for me <laughs> Yeah, I mean that. Um, I, I mean, I think dependencies. Anytime that you're reliant on a package manager to understand the dependencies, and, and usually we are, I think it, it gets pretty messy very quickly. I can hear you. I'm just gonna grab something from the other side. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Hi, Victor. Welcome. Thank you. You've jumped in on a discussion about um, a metrics model that uh, we're talking about developing for the risk working group or as part of our work in the risk working group and um, you can hear the things we were talking about and if you have any thoughts on dependencies and how they might relate to providing an introductory model of risk I, I yeah i listened to uh, a lot of discussion but i uh, dependency haven't thought about that yet I guess maybe to, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I sort of do because I feel like I I get stuck in my own head and world a lot. So I feel like if you heard the term ecosystem criticality, what do you have any sort of immediate reactions or like thoughts on what that would mean for you in the case of evaluating a package or a project? Uh, I guess first of all, uh, I have not heard about ecosystem. What is that? What does it mean? I think that's a fair reaction. <laughs> uh, there is actually multiple schools of thought across the research community as to how to actually define open source ecosystems. So that's a fairly relevant question uh, to date. Um, there are some that have looked at specific ecosystems, say, within a foundation or like defined community like the python foundation the apache foundation and looking at the interplay of community project and collaboration happening in these spaces as sort of an ecosystem um, but there are others that are looking at open source ecosystems more broadly and using the definition from biology that is sort of the, the definition of a living system um, and has the ecological and biological components as well as the the concrete things. I'm just explaining this really poorly right now, honestly. Um, <laughs> but essentially that it's it's not a stagnant system. It has living and evolving things in it that interact and interplay with each other. Um, and so we, in this particular thought, we were thinking about ecosystem to the broadest definition, but recognize that I think it's really valid that to, for you to say that, Victor, because I think Again, I get stuck in my own little world where all the people around me talk about open source ecosystems. So like, why wouldn't the rest of the world? But um, maybe then that term itself, Sean, we need to find something that's a little bit more yeah. specific, um, or maybe that'll help us narrow down what we should be looking at in terms of ecosystem. Like, I think, I think when, when we originally talked about it, it was sort of trying to conceptualize the role of a project to the world of open source users, um, which is again, incredibly broad and diverse. Um, so I guess if we look at an example like Linux versus Python, like they, are, they serve different purposes, they have different users, they have different roles in the technology stack, different communities, different types of projects that work with them. Um, and so like I would say both of them are integral to their own communities, but and maybe because they're so broad, like that, that isn't the actual metric we need. What we need is some random package or version of something that we want to know, is this something that is going to be easily disrupted by another alternative in the market? And people will, will drop it and pick up something else. I think like looking at the evolution of service meshes in the cloud native space, um, I think, I don't know, so I feel like to maybe narrow ecosystem, we could try to say within the technical sphere, maybe a name word, word that's not even a good name for it, like a, a segment or a tech segment or infrastructure. Like, how would you define 
a language versus an operating system versus a like is that a, a segment to you is that it's not really industry it's like part of a tech stack but like where i don't even know what the best word is these days no i mean it's like a classification because operating so, systems i think are a recognized classification i think languages okay. are recognized. So within a classification sorry victor you had a thought Hmm. Yeah, so uh, I, I think you, you already know that at this point I'm uh, independent, <laughs> so I, I don't have to say you know, my opinion is not represented in my employer, so that's a good thing. So I didn't go to do that. So just to use real work, I don't know what you mean by that term. Uh, so my personal opinion on that, it's a, uh, yeah, that ecosystem is very true. Uh, just an example of, uh, Really, um, you're skipping a bit for me. Yeah, your your audio is your audio is part of what you're saying, but not all of it. Yeah, your audio is breaking up quite a lot. Oh, we just lost him. No. Yeah. yeah, he was sounded like he was coming in from either a mobile or. Mm -hmm. remote reaches of, of the world and i couldn't quite hear what he was saying well i think he i think he might join again maybe we'll get his thoughts in, in a minute oh, there we here go. We go. hello hey, Victor. Hey, can you hear me can you hear me now i actually lost connection so yeah i think so, i hear you better now yes okay so um so yeah so for me uh so amazon has a first mover advantage uh, in the cloud probably cloud uh, in, in a different sense, Google is strong in the search and all that. So, so I think Google has a, done a great job uh, building a, a really open source ecosystem. So, by ecosystem, just like any like a biological ecosystem, right? Yeah, there's a big animal there. Uh, you know, so there's also like surrounding uh, small animals and trying to live together and then try to help each other. So I think, um, yeah, so, 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 so big companies like Google and, and, and later on, um, uh, uh, had, uh, VM and every joint. So that's an ecosystem that's basically, um, building a, a, a system a ecosystem so vast and so attractive to everybody, including the, the users who are not necessarily part of the ecosystem to, to use this ecosystem because that, that made uh, Amazon has to basically join the, the whole, uh, open source play right so that's yeah. that's a uh view of that ecosystem so okay oh and so i think you I think he was describing well i think problems. he was under like he was coming uh describing sort of his view of ecosystems i, I do agree that i think com like com companies can be sort of the central player in an ecosystem mm -hmm. as much as projects can <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. At least that's kind of how I was interpreting where you were going with that, Victor. We lost you again. <laughs> yeah, I lost connection. Yeah, I don't know what's happened to my it's my five G connectivity. <laughs> anyway. Actually, so uh, that's that's my yeah. view of the system. Uh, not that. Can you maybe ask the follow up question? Yeah, I actually had. Um... I have a thing in mind that I'm trying to find because I think it actually does both of the things in terms of showcasing popular projects and frameworks as an ecosystem as well as sort of the proprietary and vendor relationship to the ecosystem because i think i think what we're struggling with um in general is if we want to limit this ecosystem to something that is measurable then we have to basically write that descriptively and without getting stuck in sort of a language that doesn't make sense in all contexts. Um, I, I agree, Victor, that I think that looking at companies will, there's definitely ecosystem effect of large players um, from both what they've released as well as like, I think for me, it was always thinking about like the VMware ecosystem uh, and looking at all of the products that worked with it and grew around it. Um, and I think Linux kind of has had the same phenomena. Um, I'm sorry, I can't find this. I, I'm going to find this thing. Okay. I find it. Um, I'm basically trying to find a Stack Overflow survey that actually showed the technical technology 
overlap of user respondents and it essentially showed a natural grouping of technical like technology classes and ecosystems like the node.js ecosystem versus the python ecosystem and all the analytics tools that kind of grew up around python and kind of i like the way that it did that and i don't think I'm going to be able to find this and actually contribute to this conversation at the same time. So I'm yeah. just looking for it. I'm, I'm certainly, uh, uh, I but I think in terms of say <clears throat> understanding a project in an ecosystem, I feel like we, we shouldn't have to define the entire world to help make this like to help guide someone thinking about it. Um, so I think maybe for my own homework, um, I can try to see if there's an existing model. I think that the challenge inherently here is that, as we said with the comment of dependencies, it's always changing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this is, again, maybe this is piquing my interest because this was my my very much my old life, Sean. I don't, I didn't know you in this world, but um, okay, I don't even know what was your old life. <laughs> I was a market analyst uh, oh, wow. trying to make sense of. <laughs> evolving market categories and groupings and relationships um, yeah. as defined by the nature of the product offering. So I was looking at like products as they were defined by vendors and then looking at sort of permutations and groupings around similar product functionality. Like one example would be the DCIM market, which was the data center infrastructure monitoring tool set, which mm -hmm. was a variety of things that were basically built around telemetry in a data center. but the functionality that was incredibly broad because you had supply chain monitoring tools to how hot is my rack tools. Um, <laughs> and they all kind of fit in this place because it ended up being a combination of monitoring, inventory management, process control, um, and a whole bunch of other things. So in terms of say, looking at and defining that space, it was always moving because of what people offered in a way that like, if if we try to do this to open source, I don't I don't know if that's going to be a fruitful exercise. Um, but I, I don't know. I feel like I I'm struggling to even know how to limit this into a metric. So maybe it's something that we we chew on and say, I think there's value in here, but I don't know how we would actually define it. Yeah. Maybe maybe can really use the analogies even further. Uh, I think th there's things that probably won't need to be out of scope, like politics, right? Regional politics. That's probably out of scope. Uh, so, uh, so just just from an economic point of view, like a, just like a company, right? So, when does a company? Uh, what kind of matrix to uh, or, or symptoms you'll see when the company is going to make major decisions that's going to have an impact on the on the ecosystem, right? So. Just like a big animal, if uh, if he has a like a big fish, right? He has a lot of small fish <clears throat> surrounding him, and uh, if he's benefiting from that, you know, getting all the uh, surrounding uh, whatever nutrition he needs to 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 really uh, have a be better life, then everything is cool. Just like company, you know, when he's in the open source system, making all the good money, all, all the stuff he's contributing is coming back and you know, benefiting the company itself. Everything is cool, but when a company start to realize that uh, it, it makes more benefit mm -hmm. for him to eat the fish <laughs> beside him, and then basically deep destroy the ecosystem, meaning that he's so so uh, so. Um, for example, indicator is the company you know revenue is not growing as much expected. He might need to do something to uh, even you know earn more money by even damaging the ecosystem, and that probably will uh, he will do that. So that, that, that so so that so things like that um, uh, could be indicators or matrix for. I yeah you you just I I love it Victor and it just blew it up in my head more where I was like you have to count politics not that that's like a PC topic for this forum but just thinking about the geopolitical influence on open source right now it's pretty major in terms of say separating out China specific ecosystems because of concern from Western companies, not to say that there isn't working and productive collaborative relationships from the community level, but the companies, they have their own political arena that they're fighting with from a regulatory and from a political aspect that are influencing their decisions on what to do, what to adopt and who to work with. And we're seeing that explicitly in things like funding and sponsorship for specific countries uh, right now, especially with conflicts going on. And at a certain point, like we shouldn't have politics in a marker, but 
they do directly impact open source ecosystems because people live in these worlds and are subject to these conflicts and these regulations. So, oh my gosh, Sean, I almost like want to go full blitz. And instead of a metric, maybe we just have like, and I just, as Victor was talking, I was thinking, seeing like a big undersea environment with fish in it and plants. Okay. In it. And <laughs> it's like, I don't know, okay. I don't know how we can do this. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to define this, Sean. Maybe we pick something too big. Um, yeah, I think um, so visual, I'm just gonna make a note because we're out of time anyway, visual, a large undersea <laughs> environment. You don't have to write that down. How can we conceptualize this? <laughs> um, well, I, I, the hope is that someone's already done this because there's a lot of people that are thinking about this um, and how to how to provide more structure and taxonomy to the open source ecosystem as as broad as that can be. Um, yeah, yeah, no. I, mean, I, um, like, I don't think we're we're going to be the ones that come up with it. It's just I think that we in the metrics model, I think there are concepts here that are worth raising, but a lot of them aren't particularly measurable. Yeah, I'm I'm doing I'm using chaos data a lot right now to try to find these things. Dependencies is one. Um, companies and individuals are another dimension. Um, but yeah, it's finding it's finding the information and finding the things that seem to go together, mm -hmm. not only in deployment and dependency, but you know how to how do things flow. You know what is what are the what are the marketplaces within this ecosystem? You know, I think there's probably multiple ways to think about segmenting open source that contribute to whatever the market, whatever the um, what's the word um, segments in a market are. Oh, I have a research question for you if you're looking at it like this. Yeah. Okay. Well, just sort of wondering about from the technical usage to contrib contributor profile of the like, people tend to contribute to things that they use or they're familiar with, at least conceptually. Like, mm -hmm. are you working with a Linux kernel versus a language? Like, I'm, I'm assuming that there's some sort of technical or experience-based compatibility. But mm -hmm. then the question is people that contribute to open source are most likely working on more than one project, potentially, yep. and sort mm -hmm. of how, there's surveys that I've run that indicate that selection is very much based on more of the like a, a community fit or an interest fit versus say like a technical fit or functional fit. But I think if my hypothesis is that within companies, you'll see more of that functional fit where I'm dependent on this thing. I need to, I can just go submit a patch on this thing. And then now you're working, you're like you as a person are now creating more direct connection in the ecosystem between two mm -hmm. distinct packages that are related mm -hmm. and you are now working on both of them because they're related like i always think of mm -hmm. I think yeah Patricia upstream and, contribution to something that's not my primary job because i yeah. need it so yeah there's always sort of the, the open shift and baturgia analysis that happened with i think it was brian and miguel might have worked on it from baturgia but they also did had done it earlier where they're looking at the people overlap across the cncf and an open mm -hmm. shift and mm -hmm. basically looking at the sort of the people that were working on things. But if you look at sort of the CNCF, that is sort of a group of related technologies. So then you have the sort of functional relationship between the projects, but then underneath it, there's sort of the community relationship. Um, and so there's sort of the assumption that functionally you might work on these projects because there's alignment or dependency or interaction, but there could also be a community aspect aspect because maybe you have friends over there too and you want to work in that space as well. And so there's yeah. sort of the question of like, how are, how are like the role of people in making these things closer together versus are they coming together because of the functional comparison? And I think in my former market research days, we only looked at the functional side of things where right. now I'm curious to know, can we demonstrate that there is something else from the community and social component that drives more interconnection between these things that make them more of a like a connected ecosystem versus a disparate ecosystem because of mm -hmm. the social and community connections versus just the functional connections in the technology. I mean, we do know, um, like uh, I did a paper in 2016 where we showed that people follow, 
people follow user like users who are followed a lot or yep. start a lot. Yep. If that, that if people yeah if people go to a new project if those people go to a new project a lot of not a lot but and some people will follow them like if I go to a new project maybe nobody follows me but the people at the top of the rank on the on the platform they do have people who follow them to new projects. So they're like they're like their own little hubs themselves. Yeah. So there is this and and but it's like you know in practice do are these are these people that are being followed, are they working for a company? Like we didn't dig into that, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> well, it's definitely, it definitely yeah. people, uh, groups or clusters uh, starting from the, like the PayPal, I forgot what it's called, PayPal Mafia, I think it's called. Okay. Uh, Elon Musk and all that, uh, part of the PayPal again, of Mafia. And then, so in that, yeah, I, I even just the past several months, I see that, Many of the projects you can see that uh, it started as everybody working on the same uh, same project, and, and, and so when there's a, for example, venture capital investment in one project, uh, and then everybody started to group, group into <laughs> cluster into one company. Sometimes, uh, then that, that's also not very healthy for the. Sometimes it can be healthy; it can just make it uh, more make a product faster. Sometimes it can be uh, become a closed source project because of that. Yeah, so that's also yeah. yeah just, Concentrated well, people. Yeah, and I, I don't I even know what the PayPal mafia is. I have to Google that. <laughs> I think it's popular. Yeah, it's a, the what is called uh, Elon Musk is one. Also, the the very popular uh, the PayPal founder. I forgot who it is. Yeah, yeah, they're they're very successful. They're all coming from that one organization and start out to to just open you know open, founded many many other companies. Okay. I feel like all this right. kind of like rehashes. Oh, we're over time. Yeah, we are. I was just going to, I was waiting for Victor to finish his thought, but yeah, you can finish yours. Why not? Well, just that the transparency and interplay between community people and company seems to also be coming into this sort of ecosystem metric. So maybe we use that section for providing more clarity on it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. versus actually a metric because I, I think this is such a like risk is always going to be such a big thing um, mm -hmm. that is so contextually specific and you could always look at more things and so I think yeah. perhaps the ecosystem is just sort of a discussion on how to fine-tune the other metrics that we suggest yeah yeah one thought um thank yeah. you Sean for yeah, leading the conversation wait when, are you going to posse <laughs>